tales for dark nights. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Step right up and prepare to be unsettled. You have left behind your safe reality and fallen into darkness. There is no escape and there is no reprieve. Welcome to the Simply Scary Podcast. Season 3. Episode 3. Oh. You were expecting someone else. I'm Jason Hill, host of the Horror Hill Podcast. Filling in tonight for GM Danielson. Tonight, I'll be your guide through the twisted worlds and disturbed imagination of author Jake Try. In honor of our production of the audio edition of Jake's chilling collection, Nightmare Soup 2, the second helping. Performed by the one and only G.M. Danielson. Tonight, we bring to life five of Jake's most terrifying tales. From both his first and second books in his series. If you enjoy what you hear tonight, please show your support for both indie horror and author Jake Try by purchasing a copy of Nightmare Suit 2, The Second Helping. Now available on Amazon.com or at NightmareSuit.com, where you can pick up not only the digital edition, but the audiobook as well. Featuring 25 sinister stories performed by G.M. Danielson himself. So, without further ado, allow me to show you to your seat in tonight's Theater of Terror where the ticket for admission is well worth the price of your soul. (laughs) In our first tale tonight from Nightmare Soup 2, Chef Johnny and his waitress Katie bite off more than they can chew when they come face to face with an unruly customer with an unusual appetite. I give to you skin soup. Katie rolled her eyes as she walked past the booze. Then she took a breath, forced a smile, and turned around to face the greasy, heavy-set man speaking to her. Uh, Yes, what can I do for you this time? I'm sorry, but this chicken soup is just unacceptable. It's not hot enough, and it tastes like the cheap stuff you buy at the value market. I thought this was supposed to be homemade. It is, sir. Well, can you have the cook try again? Surely he can do better than whatever this is. (sighs) Sure thing. We'll get another bowl out to you as soon as possible. Tell him not to use as much salt. My dog wouldn't even eat this. Katie grabbed the bowl and walked back to the kitchen. 
I hate to do this to you, Johnny, but the guy says he wants another bowl of soup. He says this one is too salty or not hot enough, it doesn't taste right, uh, something like that. What? This'll be the third one. Johnny threw his arms up in the air, frustrated and tired. He was a skinny, middle-aged man with a quick temper. He was also the owner of the struggling diner. You and I both know there's nothing wrong with that soup. Everyone loves my soup. I swear, some people make it their mission in life to be jerks. I've been serving this guy for over an hour. Can you give it one more try? I really need the tip money. Even though I doubt this guy is much of a tipper. Katie was a college student who needed every dollar she could make. She was pretty, but always looked a little run down from being overworked, studying too much, and not getting enough sleep. Yeah, I'll give him one more. Guy thinks he can come in here and insult my food. It's almost closing time. I'm tired and ready to go home. Here you go, Mr. Food Critic. Johnny poured another bowl of broth and noodles, and then added some different spices and some vegetables. It smelled and looked fantastic. And one more ingredient. Johnny peeled a large sliver of dry, dead skin off his nose and dropped it into the soup. You're not seriously going to serve that, right? I certainly am. I'm the boss, and I'm not making another bowl. The guy deserves it. He's one of those people who thinks servers and cooks are just slaves that can be ordered around. Katie looked at the soup for a moment, trying to decide what to do. Uh, fine. Just because I'm ready to go home. Katie walked out to the front of the diner, where the man was waiting. He was the only customer left in the place. <sighs> Finally. It took you long enough. Katie bit her lip, fighting back the urge to say something in response. The man grabbed a spoon with his pudgy fingers, holding it like a caveman, and then slurped up some soup in a disgustingly loud fashion. By the way he was devouring it, Katie could tell he was finally satisfied. This is absolutely delicious. Well worth the wait. These herbs and spices, they're delightful. Soup was spilling from the bowl onto the table as the man lapped it up like a hungry animal. Once he was finished, he got up, paid with a ridiculously large tip, and left without saying a word. It was one of the oddest customer experiences Katie ever had. The next night the man returned, he promptly sat in the same booth and waited for Katie to take his order. Not this guy again. Hey, good to see you again. What can I get you tonight? The man tapped his fingers together in anticipation. I'll take the chicken noodle soup again. Please tell the chef to make it exactly like he did last night. Alrighty, we'll get that out to you here in a bit. Katie walked back to the kitchen and leaned up against the wall. You'll never guess who's back. Chicken noodle soup guy. Johnny threw his head back in disgust. Seriously? He says he wants the chicken noodle soup just like you made it last night. Has he been less of a jerk so far? Yeah, not too bad. <laughs> okay. We'll spare him the skin soup this time. Johnny whipped up a batch of chicken noodle soup, minus the dead skin flakes, and served it up. Katie delivered it to the anxious man. In fact, he was sweating with excitement. One bowl of chicken noodle soup. Here you go. Enjoy. The man quickly slurped up a spoonful right as Katie placed it on the table. Uh, wait. This is wrong. It's missing something. This is not exactly as it was last night. I want the exact same recipe. Um, okay. I'll tell the kitchen. Katie placed the uneaten bowl of soup in front of Johnny, unsure of what to say. Seriously, he's sending this back again. He says he wants it exactly like it was at the end of the night. Frustrated and insulted, Johnny nodded his head slowly. This guy wants the exact same thing, huh? That's fine. I'll give him exactly what he wants. Johnny scraped some dead skin from his forehead and sprinkled it into the soup like it was table salt. There you go. Serve it up. Katie brought the bowl to the man in the booth. He quickly tasted it, 
looked at Katie with a large, jagged smile and drank down the soup in a matter of seconds. Oh, yes. Oh, delicious. Marvelous. <laughs> he then immediately got up, paid with another extremely large tip, and left without saying a word. The man came back every night for two weeks, and each time he brought along a friend who was just as odd and equally as rude. Soon the diner was packed every evening with these strange customers, all demanding the special chicken noodle soup. Something was seriously off about these people, but business was better than ever, so Johnny gave them exactly what they wanted. Katie knew it was wrong, but the tips were so incredibly good that she just ignored her conscience. Then one night, Katie walked back into the kitchen and noticed Johnny rubbing some lotion on himself. His arms, face and neck were raw from peeling off skin. He was using himself like a human cheese grater. Johnny, this is insane! Look at what you're doing to yourself! Johnny hung his head for a moment. I know. This is crazy. The business was so good. I, I just couldn't stop. Katie walked towards the door. I'm going to tell them the soup is no longer available. They can order something else or leave. Katie walked out into the crowded diner where all of the strange characters were anxiously waiting. I'm sorry to disappoint you all, but we will no longer be serving the chicken noodle soup. I'm very sorry, we're, um, out of the special ingredients. The customers started yelling and screaming. The original chicken soup man stood up, his eyes fiery and intense. You don't understand. We need our soap. We need it now. The other customers continued to scream and yell. Johnny could hear everything from the kitchen. His temper started to rise, and a couple of seconds later, he completely lost it. He burst through the door and yelled at the top of his lungs. It was skin! My skin! The secret ingredient you loved so much was my gross, dead skin sprinkled into your soup. How do you like that, huh? You come in here every night, rude and demanding, treating my waitress horribly. Yeah, you tip her well. So what? That doesn't mean you can be complete jerks. No more soup. No more skin soup. You can all leave now. Goodbye. But all the customers just sat there, silently. The chicken soup man stood up again. His stare was cold and unnatural. Why? It was your skin that tasted so good. You soaked her like double. Johnny looked around in confusion. Uh, yeah, I guess so. Uh, you can all leave now. Sue me, do whatever you like. I'm done with the restaurant business. Please leave. The man took a step forward and started to drool. It made the soup so savory, like a, a rare spice. It was delicious, it's magnificent, a, a wondrous journey for the taste buds. I must have more. Hey, look, everyone, look at all that delicious skin he still has. Johnny took a step back. You're, you're creeping me out, man. I, I know what I did was horrible, but the restaurant is closed. There's the door. The chicken soup man took another step forward as all of the other customers silently stood up, each one of them salivating and biting their lips. Yeah, but we can't leave. Oh, no. We're still hungry. And there is so much of that succulent, tasty skin to go around. Enough for all of us. Katie realized something horrible was about to happen as the diners lumbered toward Johnny like zombies. Suddenly, the chicken soup man rushed forward with a ravenous, gut-wrenching scream. 
the other customer sprinted right behind him. Johnny tried to go for the back door, but there were just too many of them. Katie stumbled out of the front entrance, screaming so loudly she almost popped her own eardrums. She fell hard on the concrete of the parking lot and looked back to see the diners devouring Johnny, feasting on his skin like a rare delicacy and smiling like it was the best meal of their lives. She sprinted down the road looking for help, the sound of Johnny's horrific screams fresh in her mind, as well as the stench of hot, savory chicken noodle soup. Our second story this evening, also from Jake Try's Nightmare Soup 2, concerns our friend Gary, who, suffering from a dental dilemma, visits his dentist for what he expects to be a routine procedure. But, as Gary will soon discover, roots aren't the only thing that go deep. I give to you the toothache. Oh, God, it really hurts, Doc. Oh, Jesus, I've had cavities before, but oh, Jesus Christ, this is something else. Gary applied steady pressure to the left side of his mouth with his hand. Oh, even talking hurts. Dr. Stevenson pulled Gary's medical and dental history from an overstuffed cream folder and flipped through the information. His gray eyebrows were steady and straight, the wrinkled corners of his mouth showing zero signs of emotion. He'd been doing this for such a long time that this was just another run-of-the-mill patient. Or so he thought. Well, let's make sure there isn't an abscess or something in there. You're probably right, though. Just a nasty cavity. Lie back and let's take a look. Gary sat back as the seat automatically reclined. He was a younger guy, early 20s, but he looked a bit older. His mouth was already full of silver and gold fillings because as much as he tried, he just couldn't put down the soda and junk food. Dr. Stevenson snapped on his white latex gloves and turned on that annoyingly bright light that hovers just above the patient's face. Soon, the dental assistants and their rolling chairs wheeled over to Gary's side, ready to start the exam. Gary hated this part. They would soon be prodding around his mouth, poking, scraping, and digging with their little metal tools. They would drill his teeth with that gross, crunchy toothpaste, then use that little suction mechanism to slip up the spit coming out of his mouth. And eventually, he would get lectured about how he didn't floss enough, or how he should stop eating junk food. But first, they had to address this horrific pain. It seemed to originate in one of the back left molars, and whenever Gary moved his mouth, it sent a wave of pain radiating through his jaw and upper neck, like a pulsating electric shock. Okay, Gary, let's see what's going on. Say, ah... Dr. Stevenson leaned in with his little magnifying tool. Immediately, he saw a gaping hole inside Gary's second-to-last molar. It looked like the tooth had decayed far into the gum line and went down deep to the root. Yep, there she is. That's a big-time cavity. Looks like it's starting to form an abscess as well. That probably explains the radiating pain and swelling. To be honest, we might have to pull the tooth. Oh, seriously? It's a possibility. Let's get you over to the x-ray machine, and that will give us a better answer. Gary got up and trudged over to the x-ray room like he had several times before. It was the same old song and dance. Put the heavy plastic bib on, bite down on those plastic things, and let the x-ray machine do its work. After about 15 minutes, Dr. Stevenson walked back in with the x-rays. The stoic, emotionless expression on his face had just a hint of curiosity. 
You could tell because his eyebrows were ever so slightly turned up. Okay, Gary. Hop back into the exam chair for me. What did the x-ray show? Well, I'm not exactly sure. I need to check inside the cavity, so I'm going to numb the area before I start digging around in there. Wonderful. Gary rolled his eyes. Again, the dental assistants wheeled over, and Gary reclined back and opened his mouth. Okay, you're going to feel a slight pinch. Here it comes. Dr. Stevenson injected the surrounding area with numbing agent, then grabbed a small, needle-like tool to insert into the rotting area of the tooth. So, when we checked the x-ray, it looked like there was something lodged inside the cavity. Like what? That's what we're getting ready to find out. Dr. Stevenson carefully stuck the instrument into the rotting hole and slowly moved it around. Almost immediately, Gary felt a strange, vibrating sensation. Then he looked down to see something that startled him. Dr. Stevenson's eyes were as wide as could be, his gray eyebrows pointed up to his forehead, and his nose was wrinkled in disgust. I think I'm going to be sick. One of the assistants oh immediately God. stood up and ran away. What's wrong? Um, I'm not sure how to tell you this, Gary, but... There's a... The vibrating inside the tooth suddenly morphed into a sharp pain, cutting right through the numbing agent. The pain was like razor blades in his mouth. Something was crawling out of his cavity. He could feel it squirming and writhing as it pulled itself from the rotting hole. Pus and blood started squirting out as Gary felt little legs grasping onto his tongue. <gasps> Dr. Stevenson sat back in horror. As Gary continued screaming, a six-inch centipede, soaked in blood, emerged from the cavity where it had been living. It quickly scurried into Gary's chin and down the side of his face. It then dropped down to the floor and, in the blink of an eye, darted into a small crack in the wall. Gary never ate junk food again after that day. Our third tale tonight, also to be found in Nightmare Suit 2, follows friends Tim and Jimmy as they innocently explore a grisly scene deep in the woods, to which there might be more than meets the eye. Without further ado, I give you The Dancing Corpse. Grab your bike and follow me. Tim's eyes were wide and fiery as he stood on Jimmy's front porch, his breathing heavy and quick as he beckoned his friend to come outside. Jimmy was standing in the entryway. What's going on? He had seen this look many times before. It usually meant they were going to do something they shouldn't. You just have to see. Come on, hurry, before someone else finds it. How many times had Jimmy gone on one of these adventures, only to end up grounded for two weeks or in some other kind of trouble? Are you just gonna stand there or what? I'm telling you, this is something you need to see. Just tell me what it is. No, you won't believe me. Just come on. Jimmy rolled his eyes. Fine, but I swear, Tim, if we get in trouble this time, you're taking all the blame. Remember who had to wash Mr. Spencer's car for two weeks because you threw those eggs? Yeah, it was me. This isn't anything like that. Okay, okay, let's go. Jimmy hopped on his bike and followed Tim down the street towards the court, a cul-de-sac where all the neighborhood kids gathered to play capture the flag or have water balloon fights. Jimmy could barely keep up as Tim blazed down the street, his legs pedaling frantically. Hey, slow down! Pedal faster. As they reached the end of the street, where the pavement opened to a large circle, Tim dumped his bike at the curb and dashed around to the back of Danny Fletcher's house. Jimmy was right behind him. Everyone knew this was the best way to the train tracks, an area Jimmy was specifically told never to go. 
But parental warnings had never stopped their adventures before, and this time was no different. The path to the tracks was almost mystical, something straight from the pages of Huckleberry Finn. A sprawling golden wheat field pushed up against a thick wooded area. Right in between was a slim trail of flattened grass that would lead them to their destination. The last time the two boys had been back here, they stumbled upon an old junkyard. And to a 12-year-old boy, that's nearly the same thing as finding buried treasure. You know how we wanted to build a go-kart? Well, I came back here earlier to find a steering wheel. Jimmy grabbed a large stick and started knocking down the brush at the entrance of the woods. When I was headed back, I took a wrong turn that led to an old bridge by the train tracks. That's where I found it, under that bridge. Found what? You'll see. I'm gonna warn you, though. Think of the worst thing you've ever seen, and this is worse than that. Jimmy stopped in his tracks. Wait, worse than the worst thing I've seen in my life? Worse than that time Matt Morrison broke his leg and the bone was sticking out of his skin? Way worse. What if I don't want to see this thing? It's not gonna hurt you. Quit being a wuss. Tim continued to knock down wild brush and tree limbs as they followed the path. They soon came to a split, one way leading to the junkyard and the other to the train tracks. Come on, it's this way. The grassy pathway soon turned to dirt as the wood started to thin. Jimmy's stomach knotted up. What could be worse than a bone sticking out of someone's leg? A large maple tree stood at the end of the path, almost like a guardian protecting something. A large X was carved into the trunk. Jimmy didn't know what that meant, but it made the knot in his stomach tighten even more. As they passed the maple tree and exited the woods, the dirt path ran right into the train tracks. Jimmy raised his hand to shield his eyes from the baking August sun, and as he looked down the line of rusted steel, he saw an old abandoned bridge about 50 yards away. The concrete was cracked and covered in faded graffiti. Even out here, the bridge couldn't escape the nocturnal hooligans and their spray paint. You ready for this? A bead of sweat dripped from Tim's forehead as the same wide-eyed glare returned to his face. Let's just get this over with. Jimmy took a couple of steps forward, and that's when the smell stung his nostrils. <coughs> It was absolutely putrid, so vile and rank that his gag impulse kicked in, forcing him to cough and spit on the ground. It was like roadkill mixed with fresh sewage. What is that smell? Tim just covered his nose with his shirt and continued forward. The area under the bridge was bathed in shadow. It seemed unusually dark for how bright it was outside. Almost like the bridge was trying to hide a secret. But as the boy stepped closer, that secret slowly revealed itself. A shoe was the first thing Jimmy saw. A black dress shoe, scuffed and faded from the dirt and sun. It was the only thing sticking out of the shadows. As he got closer, his gaze followed the shoe to a pant leg. Dress pants, blue, maybe black, he couldn't tell. Jimmy's eyes adjusted to make out a figure hunched over in the darkness, propped up against the wall. He could see a white dress shirt covered in dark reddish-brown splotches. Was that dried blood? His mind started piecing together the grisly image before him. It was blood. Lots of blood. There was a tie. It was striped and ugly, a stale yellow and dull blue, which led up to a face. A horrifying, nightmare-inducing face. The skin was leathery and pale, almost grayish in tint but with splatters of yellow and a specific shade of green that only shows up in thick mucus. Rotting flesh gave way to deep red holes and dried, crusty boils. 
The area around the lips was jagged and torn, revealing a gruesome, permanent smile. And its eyes were half eaten away, set deep into their nearly hollow sockets. <laughs> The full image of the corpse finally hit Jimmy, and he immediately fell to his knees and threw up his lunch. That's a dead body. Yeah, I know. Tim still had his shirt up to his nose. We need to call the police or tell our parents, like, right now! Jimmy stood up and wiped his mouth. Tim was right. This was by far the worst thing he had ever seen. We will, we will. But I have to show you something first. What else could you possibly show me? It's a dead guy, just sitting there, running. There's blood. He was probably murdered or something. Just watch. Tim pulled out his cell phone and started scrolling through it. I was scared just like you when I first saw this, so I pulled my phone out to take a picture. But my hands were shaking so bad that I dropped it on the ground. Somehow my ringtone went off, and when that happened, I swear, Jimmy, it moved. What do you mean it moved? I mean it moved. That's impossible. Tim pressed a button on his phone and a light-hearted jingle started playing. The two boys immediately looked over to the corpse. Nothing happened. See, I told you, now let's get out of here and go tell the cops. Tim moved closer to the corpse, slowly turning up the volume as the jingle continued to play. Suddenly, one of the legs started to slightly wiggle. There it was! Did you see that? Jimmy immediately backed away. How can that happen? Could he still be alive? Jimmy again gazed into the cold, dead stare of the corpse. Jimmy, look at him. Does it look like he could still be alive? No, he's definitely dead. The terror gripping both boys soon turned to a frightened curiosity. I'm gonna try playing something else. Tim opened his music app and selected a heavy metal song. The guitars and wailing of the lead singer echoed off the concrete walls. Both legs of the corpse immediately sprang to life, violently jerking and flailing around. Its arms soon followed. <laughs> the boys ran to the other side of the bridge in sheer panic. Tim turned the music off, and the corpse's arms and legs flopped to the ground. Lifeless, as they should have been. Jimmy had played this game long enough. This is insane! We need to get out of here right now! Just one more time. I need to get this on video so people will believe us. Fine. Then we are going straight to our parents. Tim nodded in agreement and walked back up to the corpse. He turned the phone's volume up as loud as it could go and selected a hard-hitting rap song with heavy bass. As soon as the music started, the corpse began to dance again. It was jerking, vibrating, pulsating, convulsing. Its arms and legs jumped off the ground like it was being electrocuted. Tim started moving closer, and the movements became more violent. Tim, that's close enough. But Tim ignored Jimmy's warning, again stepping closer with his phone held out in front of him. Tim, that thing is going to touch you. But Tim kept moving his gruesome curiosity propelling him forward. Tim put the phone up to the corpse's ear, or what was left of it. At this point, the corpse was shaking so violently that its body nearly danced away from the wall. Every inch was now vibrating and pulsing. Suddenly, the stomach of the corpse started to rapidly expand. Tim knelt down to get a better look as Jimmy screamed at him from the other side of the bridge. Jim! Get away from that thing now! But it was too late. The stomach erupted like a volcano, spewing thousands of squirming maggots all over Tim's face and body. More maggots exploded from the corpse's legs and arms, and finally, from the eye sockets. The maggots writhed and jittered. Their bodies pulsed and jerked as the music blared. Tim screamed in horror as they slithered through his hair and under his shirt. Jimmy ran over to Tim and grabbed his phone. 
the music wouldn't turn off. So he threw it against the wall as hard as he could, shattering it to pieces. As soon as the music caught off, the maggots stopped squirming. Tim was still screaming as he ripped his shirt off and shook the excess maggots from his skin. Back, get him off, get him off! The boys backed away in disgust, the taste of vomit filling their mouths as they watched the maggots slowly crawl back into the corpse and continue feeding on its rotting flesh. <laughs> Thank you for joining us tonight for the Simply Scary Podcast. If you like what you've heard and would like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's episode, which includes two more terrifying tales, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself on Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, where you can sign up for a season pass and get access to all 24 ad-free extended episodes from this season. Or sign up as a patron for just $5 per month and get access to not just this program, but our network's audio archive of hundreds of previous releases, including premium versions of our other shows, such as Horror Hill and scary stories told in the dark. (laughs) Not only that, but you'll be lending your support to this very program and help us continue bringing nightmares to life each and every week. Thank you for your support. Thanks for listening. I'm Steve Taylor. And you've been listening to the Simply Scary Podcast, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's episode was written by Craig Roshek and performed by special guests Jason Hill, host of the Horror Hill podcast, and Otis Jiry, host of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com today to support this program by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to premium extended versions of our episodes, our audio archive, and ad-free downloads of all of your favorite stories, including those you've heard today. The host of the Simply Scary podcast is GM Danielson. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music for the program was produced by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering are overseen by the executive producer and director, Craig Groshek, with production of individual stories by members of our talented sound design team. Artwork for the show's episodes by David Romero. For more information about the authors, performers, and artists involved in the production of this and our other episodes, visit our website today. Got a scary story of your own that you'd like performed? We take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tale considered for production in a future episode of this show. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program, and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to us. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and our other programs. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, Hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon to get more spooky tales from us and another episode of this program each and every Tuesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button and tell us how we're doing and leave a comment. Until next week, listeners, turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Join 
tales for dark nights.